So then, now that we're here, I will uh, kick things off. We'll give Dennis a chance to catch up with us a little bit as I do a welcome to uh, folks for joining us to this webinar on taxes and beginning farmers since it is that season again this year and uh, this is an opportunity for you to learn some of the basics about the um, implications regarding ta taxation and farming and uh, Dennis has been um, involved with this topic for some time and was uh, part of a committee that wrote um, some of the IRS assistant information, assistance information. So this should provide you a good basis for getting started with this. This webinar is part of the UVM New Farmer Program webinar series that's um, funded in part by a grant from the Working Lands um, Investment Board. And um, we're very excited to have you here and very excited to have Dennis able to talk to us. So Dennis, I'm going to turn this over to you. And I assume you'll, you'll forward your slides as needed. Yes, Heidi, I will forward my slides as needed. And thank you for being here, folks, today. And thanks for your patience with my bumbling on the computer. I'm going to uh, visit with you some about taxes, pr primarily federal income taxes and beginning farmers. And uh, I'd like to thank a couple of the folks that uh, provided me with some slides and some guidance on this. Lauren Jarvie, an enrolled agent here in St. Johnsbury. Mike Shibarasi from UNH Ex Extension. And uh, Carol Zintel from Farm Credit East in New Hampshire. Um, let's see, the, the general rule of the tax system is that if you get it, it's to income. And then the other, another general rule is that income is taxable unless it's very specifically excluded. And then an interesting quote that I came by a few years ago was that there is no table under which you can pass cash. Lots of times people talk about cash going under the table. Um, uh, it's still taxable then. Oh, let's see here. Uh, these are some of the basics that I'm going to be um, hitting on today for the next 50 minutes or so. First one, startup decisions. Um, is your farm a hobby or is it a business? Either one is fine, but you should make sure you understand which is which and the implications of it. Uh, another one is separating farm income and expenses from personal income and expenses. Uh, third one, it will tip our hat to depreciation and very briefly on the sales of business property. Um, we'll talk just a little bit about employer and employee issues, um, a little bit about self-employment tax, and um, a bit about Vermont taxation and farms. Um, this is the IRS publication called the Farmer's Tax Guide. Um, let's see, it's uh, not 90 pages of information on uh, how the federal tax rules and regulations affect farmers in the United States. Um, like Heidi said, I've been a member of this uh, National Farm Income Tax Extension Committee. That's an acknowledgement on the front cover. This thing is a, a, an annual publication, and it's available online from irs.gov. Um, and it's, you type in irs.gov Farmers Tax Guide Publication 225, and bingo, there you are. Uh, there's 16 chapters in here. I think the most interesting one is uh, chapter number four, farm business expenses. I think it's a good idea for farmers to uh, read through that chapter to make sure they're claiming all of the business deductions that they're able to. Uh, the other chapters are very good and they're interesting, but the publication is not meant to be read through cover to cover. It's kind of uh, answers and descriptions. Uh, there's a pretty good index in it, and uh, if you take a look at the chapters, uh, you can learn 
more information about farms and taxes. Um, there's also an instruction set of instruction pages for uh, Schedule F on tax form, and that's available online also if you go to irs.gov and search for instructions for Schedule F. Um, you'll get information about what's supposed to be on each line of Schedule F. Uh, there's other good sources of farm tax information. The first one that I'll mention here is ruraltax.org. Um, it's the people that are on that National Farm Income Tax Extension Committee. Um, some of the stuff that used to be in the Farmer's Tax Guide IRS has decided to not include it, mainly for um, cost reasons, that it's expensive to print a publication. One of the things that's not in the Farmer's Tax Guide is a set of, it's a comprehensive farm tax example with all of the forms filled out, and you can track the numbers from one form to another. And uh, that was the very first thing that we put onto ruraltax.org. There's also short uh, two and three page publications about various farm tax topics. Another one is if Penn State Ag Alternatives has a real good article called Understanding Your Federal Farm Income Taxes. It's really easy to find if you Google those two things together. And that was written by Mike Shibarasi from UNH Extension. It doesn't get into the percentages and stuff like that, but it's the concepts, because the concepts stay with us for quite a while, and the percentages, percentages are apt to change. Um, there's another publication on Farm Doc Daily that was put up on September 24th, 2014. Farm Doc Daily is a website from the University of Illinois. And this uh, article is Farmers and Small Farms Can Maximize Tax Savings from Health Insurance Costs. So it discusses the Obamacare and uh, farms. Um, this is the uh, federal individual income tax return 2014. I'm sure that most of you have seen this thing. If you haven't seen it, you've probably signed it. Um, and I've got uh, arrows going to wages, which a lot of people have. There's, on the income side, on line 12 is a spot to catch business income. On line 13 is a place that catches capital gains. Um, a capital gain or a capital loss. And then line 18 is farm income. And so farm income is just another source of income once you've filled out the 1040F. Um, you can see line 18. Well, you may or not, may not be able to see line 18, but it says farm income or loss attached Schedule F. So Schedule F categorizes your income and expenses and sorts them, and then the profit or loss winds up on line 18 of the schedule of the 1040. Um, looking back just a little bit, we were into the 1040, and now we'll step back just a little bit and get to the uh, beginning farm uh, part of the title of the talk. And uh, it's beginning farmers have a number of startup decisions. One of the ones, one of the decisions is how are you going to keep your financial records? And um, you can keep them any number of ways from a three ring binder to a, comp a program like QuickBooks or AgCheck. Um, it doesn't make too much difference tax wise how you record the data. What you do need to do is you need to be able to collect it all, and you need to be able to sort it, and you need to be able to create a report. Ideally, you'll have a, some kind of a system that you're comfortable with and can understand. It's a, you need to have a financial record keeping system that is pretty easy to keep up to date so that 
you can do it on a regular basis, and you want to be able to catch all of your deductible expenses. If you use a computer program like Mint or or uh, Quicken or QuickBooks or Peachtree or any of those, one of the real important things is your so-called chart of accounts that gathers types of income and types of expenses and sorts those things. Um, one of the folks that does farm taxes around says that it takes a computer to make a real mess of things. And if you've got a chart of accounts that creates a six-page report, uh, your chart of accounts isn't working for you like it could. Um, the New England Extension uh, services around uh, New England have a, a farm account book that's just a ledger book. Many other states have those as well. They do a real good job of recording income and expense, but a very poor job of reporting income and expense. The folks at um, University of Maine Extension a couple of years ago put the farm account book onto a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, and that does a pretty nice job of reporting and recording. I think that you can find that online um, from the University of Maine. It's free, and it's, it's a nice, nice tool. Uh, another thing that you've got to do when you start your business, farm business, is to register your business name with the Secretary of State. The website is right there for the Vermont Secretary of State. Other states probably have a very similar setup. Um, you have to select the, what kind of entity you're going to be. Um, the default position on business entity is sole proprietor. And then you can have uh, partnerships, LLCs, um, some small business corporations, subchapter S, uh, big corporations, subchapter C, silent partners, any number of things. But uh, you've got to select it. And then that's a legal decision. And your legal decision there has tax implications about how is this business going to be taxed. Um, it's in order to set up a business checking account, you need to have an employee identifi employer identification number with IRS. And that's pretty easy to do online. If you go to irs.gov, you can type in EIN, and there's a form for you to get an employee identification number. Employer identification number, I'm sorry. Uh, another step is to open a business checking account so that your business is operating in that checking account, and your family is operating in a different account. And hopefully, there will be money from the business account that you'll be able to write a check to yourself to deposit into the personal checking account for your family to live on. Uh, for years, lots of farms have combined the two and just used one checking account. It's simpler, but um, it's it's simpler day by day, but it's more difficult at the end of the year to try to sort out which expenses are which. Um, and if you, you have two checking accounts or two bank, and account, bank accounts, the temptation isn't to buy the new washing machine for the family from the business account. And uh, the, there, it's easier to discipline yourself so that you aren't buying business items or paying for business items through the personal account. So it makes it a little bit clearer, that line. And there are, there are ways to deduct startup costs. Uh, the Farmer's Tax Guide on page 24 and 46 describe how a uh, new business can deduct startup costs. So you want to have your record keeping system um, activated fairly early on so that you can collect all of your expenses and legally deduct them. Um, there's this IRS publication 583, Starting a Business and Keeping Records. That gets into some of the basics. Um, you've got to have a categorized list of income and expenses. Not all income is the same. Um, you've got to be, not all expenses are the same either. 
uh, you need to be able to track assets that you buy, assets that you sell, assets that you trade. You have to be able to have enough information to either fill out and send the 1099 informational returns to people that you do business with or have enough information so that the person that does your taxes can get that information relatively easily. If you have an employee, there's a number of payroll records that you have to keep and you have to be withholding uh, Social Security taxes and income taxes and then you have to be making payments to federal and state government on a timely basis for your employees and the withholding that you've taken from the withholding tax that you've taken from them. Other things that are handy to have but aren't critical for taxes are the quantities of different products that are sold. The IRS doesn't really care how many head of animals you sold or how many bushels of potatoes you sold or how many hundredweight of milk you sold. They're interested in the dollars and cents. Um, it's also helpful to be able to track inventory for your balance sheet of what you own and owe at the beginning of the year. And then you need to be able to track accounts receivable as well. Um, and IRS doesn't really care about receivables. Uh, IRS cares, uh, farmers are able to uh, do their taxes on a cash basis so that you recognize income that has come onto the farm between January 1 and December 31st and you also recognize and claim expenses that occurred during that period. Uh, sometimes at the beginning of the year you may have sold the product in December but haven't received payment for it and uh, for IRS uh, if, you're, if you're doing your taxes on a cash basis you don't claim the income until you receive the money. Um, one of the questions is, do you have a business or do you, ho do you have a hobby farm? Um, for farm businesses, like I mentioned before, you'll use uh, Schedule F of Form 1040. Um, farm, the Farmer's Tax Guide on page 26 and 27 goes into quite a bit of detail if you are not for profit farming, is what they call it. Um, lots of other people call it hobby farming. Um, if you are doing any kind of a hobby, hobby income is supposed to pop onto your Form 1040 on line 21 and then hobby expenses get claimed on Schedule A you know, if that's your form for um, itemized deductions and there are limits as to how much hobby expenses you can claim. Um, for a farm business, you're supposed to be making a profit in three of five years. So if you are continually operating at a loss, uh, you could conceivably get a communication from IRS that they are interested in auditing and seeing um, why is your business continuing to uh, show losses and you're trying to deduct those as business losses. Um, on page 26 of the Farmer's Tax Guide, there's a list of nine factors uh, that can show that you are trying to farm for a profit. Are you farming in a business-like manner? The amount of time and effort you're devoting to the business. Is this your livelihood or do you have another job or another business? Have you been making changes to try to improve your profits? Are you using advisors and are you doing what the advisors say? And then are you able to make a profit in some years and not others? So there's a number of questions that IRS does use if um, your farm is continually showing losses and they're trying to figure out uh, are you shielding other income from this farm? Uh, there's a lot of that that happens and um, Uncle Sam needs money. IRS is out there to find the money from Uncle Sam and this is one of the things they look at. Um, lots of times people ask uh, what is a farm and unfortunately that seems like a real easy question uh, but it's, it's a, not an easy question because state governments have a number of 
definitions for farms. Um, the state uh, tax department has a couple of definitions for farms. One that we'll talk about a little bit later is um, on the use value appraisal, where farmers can get a break on their property taxes if they're a farm. Uh, the definition for that is different than other definitions. Um, the IRS definition says that that uh, a farm is in the business of cultivating, operating, or managing a farm for profit, but not timber. And then they have a list of specifics that uh, in IRS, in the IRS world, the farm includes livestock, dairy, poultry, fish, fruit, and truck farms. It also includes fish farms, plant nurseries, orchards, plantations, ranches, greenhouses, and bees. Um, one of the uh, bones of contention in recent years has been that alpaca is not on here, and um, alpaca farms aren't supposed to use the 1040F because IRS says they aren't farms. Um, one of the very unusual things is that uh, uh, maple syrup operations, um, if a person has a sugar bush and is just um, collecting the sap and gathering the sap, that's farm because you're producing a product up to its first marketable point, which is sap, because there is a market for sap. If you're boiling sap and making syrup, that's not a farm operation, that's a processing operation. So uh, sugar makers are supposed to be using the Form 1040 Schedule C, which is the regular business form and not Schedule F, which is farm. Uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, lots of farms have uh, cheese, make cheese or other products, and uh, the, the farm, the producing the stuff is farm, but once you start processing it and making cheese, the cheese is a different operation that's supposed to be a different business, and they're supposed to be filing a Schedule C. Uh, this isn't handy, and it isn't easy, but that's the way it is. And then ag tourism is the same thing, that uh, producing a product uh, from livestock, dairy, poultry, fish, fruit, and truck farms, uh, that is farming. Uh, bringing visitors onto your farm, um, that's not a farming enterprise. That's a different kind of a business enterprise that's supposed to use the Schedule C. So depending upon um, what your tax advisor suggests, you may uh, file both a Schedule C and a Schedule F, um, which makes a little bit more, it makes the bookkeeping slightly more challenging, but if you have a good chart of accounts, uh, you can handle it all right. Um, there's different money that uh, a business creates. One is profit from operating. You uh, grow potatoes and you sell potatoes and the difference between what you receive and what you spend is a profit and that's an operating profit and that's taxed. You might have a gain from the sale of an asset. You might have a uh, tractor that you buy, and use it for a number of years and then sell it and you could conceivably have a gain from the sale of that tractor the, that gain, the dollars from that gain is handled slightly different than the dollars from the operating. And then borrowing money, or if you, if you borrow money, that cash comes onto the farm, that's not taxable. And then sometimes you may, have, you may receive a return of capital that you've invested, and that money also is not taxable. So. You, your bookkeeping system has to be able to handle these different types of transactions so that you're not um, paying more tax than you need to. Uh, business profits, the general uh, profit equation is pretty simple. Income minus expense equals profit. And your profit moves on to a 1040 to be taxed at federal and state levels, perhaps. Um, 
there's a tax on corporate profits at the business level, but there's no tax at the business level for a sole proprietor, a partnership, a limited liability company that's taxed as a, prof as a partnership. There's, the entity is not taxed, the individual is taxed. So um, your farm would fill out a 1040 Schedule F, income minus expense. The profit number goes on to your individual 1040, and you pay tax, and that's all there is. Um, the, the, the money that moves from the Schedule F onto your individual form, there's no tax there. It's taxed by you, the individual. For um, Apple and what was it, Burger King and IBM and all those corporations, they pay a corporate tax and then they send the profits out to their shareholders as dividends and then the shareholders also pay a tax on the dividends. Um, what was it? It was Tim Horton and uh, Burger King here in the last month or two, which the Burger King is trying to shield profit, corporate profits from U.S. taxation. So they merged with a, a company in uh, Canada and so those profits don't appear in the U.S. so they aren't taxed by the U.S. and Uncle needs money so Uncle is trying to close in on that as well. Um, with a partnership, what happens is the farm partnership fills out a 1040F and then the, there's a special uh, series of forms where the partnership profit is sent out to each of the partners and the partners claim their share of partnership profits on their individual tax return and then the, their share of the profits is taxed by them and they pay tax on it themselves individually. So the business isn't taxed, the owner is taxed. I hope that was clear. I'm not um, here's the uh, form 1040, Schedule F, the farm tax return. And uh, there's part one, which is income, part two, which expe is expense. And then at the bottom is uh, net farm profit or loss. And then that net farm profit or loss gets moved on to your individual 1040. Um, this is uh, like a, uh, an income statement or a profit and loss statement. Lots of times this is the only income statement that a farmer uh, sees. Uh, it's not a real good income statement because it, all of the um, sales of livestock and other products, everything is all lumped into one line on line two. Uh, so it's not pretty because you don't know how many qu what quantities of stuff or if you've got several enterprises, you don't know what income came from which enterprise, it's just a bango, all right there on line two. Um, but that's the form we have. Uh, you can see, uh, you may, well, let's go to the next slide. I think I have them lined up. To, yeah. Uh, from income on that part one, sales of products raised or grown, products purchased for resale, income from farm related services, payments from agricultural programs, and it includes barter. Uh, lots of people uh, do barter in order to pass money under the table and one of those earlier slides uh, mentioned that there is no table under which you can pass money without being taxed and you're supposed to claim barter income and that's described on page 17 of the Farmer's Tax Guide. Uh, but uh, there's a number of, of uh, farms in Vermont that have uh, farm stands and or and usually that's their own product but sometimes they buy product and sell it and that's also uh, an item that's just lumped in there with on farm income. Um, income from farm related services, perhaps you do custom work for a neighbor and you might uh, do some raking for them or some mowing for them. Um, the money that you receive from
in that service also appears on your Schedule F, and the expenses would also be on Schedule F. Um, the custom hire income is on line 7, so that uh, if you do machinery work or another service for a farmer, the money would appear there on line 7, and your expenses would all be there in part 2. Uh, this is money from normal business operations, and uh, farmers are allowed to use cash accounting, like I mentioned earlier, that um, uh, it's money that you receive from January 1 until December 31 that you that shows on a 1040F. And then it's money received during the year that you may have sold the product and not received money for it yet. But if you haven't received the money, it's invisible for that year's tax return. And uh, I know sometimes um, on the expense side in particular, it's uh, difficult if you're, some, some, it's easy enough to track checks and stuff that are paid by the farm. Sometimes credit card purchases don't get tracked as well. And then sometimes it's difficult to keep track of cash payments for stuff as well. Uh, some of the farm pickup trucks that I see have uh, lots of uh, receipts on the dashboard. And uh, those sometimes some of those are, are deductible business expenses. So the challenge is how how do you go about collecting those? Um, one neat uh, method that I've run across is that um, one farm that I go to, they have their entryway from the into the house. People take their boots off. They've got hooks there, put jackets on. And then they've got a yellow manila envelope tacked to the wall right there to catch um, receipts so that, uh, so that the receipts are caught before they go through the washing machine. And you can enter those expenses into the financial bookkeeping. Uh, farm expenses, those, that's in the second half of the uh, 1040 Schedule F. And those are ordinary and necessary costs of operating a farm for profit. And that's the things that are described quite fully in Chapter 4 of the Farmer's Tax Guide. And these are the expense lines that are listed on the 1040 Schedule F in alphabetical order. Car and truck, so that would be repairs or tires or registration for farm vehicles. Custom hire, which would be um, you hire somebody to come onto your farm and do certain tasks. Uh, depreciation, a non-cash expense that we'll get into in a few minutes. Feed that you buy to feed to your animals. Fertilizer and lime that you buy and use on your, on your fields. Freight and trucking to either Get, a pro get something that you buy to the farm or to get your product to a sales point. Gas, fuel, and oil. Insurance. Interest. Labor hired. Rent or lease of buildings or land or, or equipment. Repairs on farm buildings and farm equipment, seeds and plants, supplies. That's a pretty big catch-all. It could be everything from baler twine to livestock ear tags or to soaps and detergents that are used in uh, uh, milk room. Uh, property taxes, utilities, veterinarian expenses and breeding expenses, medicines. And then there's another big catch-all there, which is other expenses. That includes um, educational programs that you attend for the farm. Uh, it would include subscriptions. It might include record keeping expenses. It might include your farm tax preparation. Uh, if the farm had some legal work during the course of the year, it might be legal work. It might be uh, production testing for uh, dairy herd improvement records, or what have you. 
Uh, there's several of these expenses that uh, are some, some uh, record keeping systems call them farm and home expenses where they're partially farm and partially home. Uh, those are things such as uh, interest, uh, insurance, property taxes, and utilities that um, the town sends you one bill for property taxes and uh, some of it is farmland and farm buildings and some of it is your personal home. Um, you're supposed to tease that out and have the farm pay for the farm stuff and have you as an individual pay for the tax on your home and two acres. And this, with utilities, lots of times there's only one meter going onto a farm. And then uh, the thing to do is to talk with your uh, tax preparer about um, a reasonable allocation between the farm and the family. And the same with insurance. Perhaps your insurance agent could help you figure out um, what percent of your bill is for farm tax and what uh, or what, what percent of your bill is for insuring farm buildings and farm liability versus insuring your home and your home liability. Um, business expenses paid during the year by cash, check, and credit card, not personal expenses. You're not supposed to have your dog food in there unless the dog is a working dog on the farm. You're not supposed to have pets in there. Um, this uh, I've mentioned cash, check, and credit card earlier. Uh, paying for stuff on the credit card, uh, IRS doesn't accept the credit card bill as the documentation that this was a farm expense. IRS wants to see receipts on the sales. So if you buy stuff, using a credit card, you want, still want to be able to keep those receipts that show what the item was for, not the business that received the money. So it's a, another record keeping issue. Um, depreciation represents uh, using up or wearing out of equipment. and um, the idea is, is that you buy a capital item and it lasts for a number of years and you spread the cost over a number of years, taking a little bit of it each year. Um, that uh, sugar and arch there uh, was paid for. Well, I don't know if it was paid for in one year. They might have bought it, uh, might have borrowed money to buy it. Um, but they would spread the life of that over several years and take a depreciation expense that's allowed by IRS in each year. Um, when you buy something like that, you want to identify the item. Uh, you want to have the date that you bought it and you want to have the amount paid so that um, you or your tax person can calculate out how much depreciation you can take in the year of purchase, how much you can take each of the years during the life of that equipment, and then how much you would also take in the last year of the depreciation. Uh, the asset might well last beyond its depreciable life, which is fine, but um, you'd be taking a, a depreciation expense for a given number of years. IRS has very, very specific rules on this and how many years and the method. Um, farmers uh, don't have as much leeway as other businesses in terms of what method you can use and the depreciable life of farm equipment is somewhat less than other business equipment. Uh, farmers um, have a couple of selections under the Makers depreciation modified accelerated cost recovery system or the ADS system, um, and that's also that's described in the uh, depreciation chapter 
of uh, of the farmer's tax guide um, start, starts on page 35, and there's a number of tables in that chapter that um, get at the life of different farm assets. Uh, livestock is generally uh, five or seven years, and uh, you've got to keep track of when when it comes onto the farm and when it leaves the farm. Um, so that the money is handled properly. The, I mentioned a little bit earlier that the actual life is not the same as a depreciable life. Uh, tractors might be depreciated for seven years, but it might last for 15 years. Um, then there's something that's called the Section 179 expense deduction. I think about it as um, instant depreciation, and uh, it's a political football. Uh, the, the default for a year of Section 179 expense deduction now is $25,000, and it wasn't until mid-December of 2014 when Congress up the limit from $25,000 to $500,000 for 2014. Um, so that didn't help farmers or other business owners plan capital purchases very well during the course of the year because they just didn't know how much uh, Section 179 they'd have. Um, the theory behind Section 179 is with a higher number, like $500,000, uh, people, for, uh, business owners will be investing in capital equipment, and businesses will have to make that capital equipment in order to sell. So it kind of stimulates demand of of uh, capital equipment. Uh, but if you don't know that you've got it until December, mid-December, it doesn't really help very much. And in December of 14, they upped the limit from $25,000 to $500,000 retroactively for 2014, and they did it just for that year, um, which, again, uh, people don't know what Section 179 limit will be for 2015. Uh, there's, there's another type of property that's called listed property that is business and personal use. And uh, again, there's very specific rules about how much of that can be depreciated and the lives and stuff, and that includes stuff like computers, which um, lots of times farm computers are used for farms, for the farm business, and also for personal use. So uh, you've got to, there's limits as to what can, how, how quickly that stuff can be depreciated. And another one is uh, cars and pickup trucks. Uh, are listed property that are handled very specifically and differently than other uh, depreciable assets. And like I mentioned before, you can you can uh, amortize startup costs and you can deduct a little bit of them in one year, but then you amortize them, which is similar to depreciation, and you amortize them over 15 years, and that's described also in the farmer's tax guide there. And like I mentioned, uh, there's a whole chapter on depreciation in the Farmer's Tax Guide. It's, uh, it's chapter number seven, and there's some good tables in that, in that chapter. Um, sales of business property. Uh, the, st the stuff that's included here is usually not a farm product. Uh, one of the sales of business property that I'm quite familiar with is the sale of cull dairy cows. It might be a five-year-old cow that uh, five or six or a ten-year-old cow whose milking life is over and uh, she's been uh, an asset on the farm and uh, both a productive asset and a capital asset on the farm. And then when her life is, is over and she gets shipped for beef, uh, that's the sale of business property, so that money from that sale is handled differently than the sale of milk from that cow. Uh, usually business property is on the farm for more than one year, 
and you, there, you may have a gain or a loss from the sale of that business property. There's a special form that catches this information and teases that money out into different categories, and that is Form 4797. Uh, the sale of business property is not ordinary income. It's generally taxed at a lower capital gains rate, which is a lower, quite often a low, well, it is a lower rate than earned income. And then you don't pay self-employment self tax on a, a capital gain either. And again, the records are very important. Uh, you have to have your date of purchase, date of sale, sales price, and is there a trade involved so that um, either you or your tax person can categorize this sale and figure out how much is a return of capital, how much is a gain, and figure out uh, what's taxable and at what rate. Uh, hired labor, uh, wages, taxes, and benefits uh, that you pay to an employee are deductible business expenses. You can hire family members, uh, and there are some special rules with family members. This stuff is described on, in Chapter 13 of the Farmer's Tax Guide. Uh, you have to be withholding taxes, both federal and state taxes, from employees. Uh, the, the amount of withholding is based on a W-4 that they that the employee fills out and gives the employer. Uh, you have to withhold federal Social Security tax in most cases. And if you have a lot of employees, you may be um, withholding federal or state unemployment tax or paying that tax on these employees as well. Um, Farmer's Tax Guide, page 74 to 78, gets into some of this stuff. And there's a special publication, an IRS publication called Circular A, which is the employer's tax guide that gets into the fine points and the nitty gritty. In Vermont, um, you have to have, the law says that you will have uh, workers' compensation insurance on your employees once your payroll hits $10,000. Um, some states, it's less than that. For non-farm businesses in Vermont, it's also less than that. Um, $10,000 sounds like a lot, or any kind of in workers' compensation sounds like a lot until you have an accident or an employee has an accident, and then um, it doesn't sound like so much. Uh, one firm that I've worked with uh, didn't have workers' compensation until the day after the accident. And then they got workers' comp and they kept it. Uh, you can talk to your regular insurance agent about what the rates are. Uh, the rates vary with uh, what your payroll is. And um, an employer has very specific legal responsibilities to employees. And uh, you've got to be aware of that. Um, the other thing is that every now and then you read about, or at least I see it in the paper, where um, uh, an employer has spent the withheld taxes and not uh, paid that into either the state or federal government. And there's a special spot in hell for those employers that uh, federal and state folks take that very, very seriously when you're withholding money from an employer employee. Um, for new employees, I uh, have to give an employer uh, form SS4 and then also, uh, well, no, let me see. First off, if you employ people, you need to have an ID number, employee, employer ID number, and then the employee has to give you a form I-9 and you're supposed to check certain documentation, pieces of documentation that um, say that it is legal for this person to be working in the states and uh, that you've checked this stuff. Um, the form indicates that you don't have, let me see, you are not qualified to say whether or not that is a real Social Security card, um, just that you've seen the card that was presented. So you're not supposed to be able to tell a fake from a real one. Um, 
for an employee, you as the employer control what is going to be done and how they're going to do it. You determine how the worker is paid and if you're going to be reimbursing their expenses for travel, say. And you generally have a continuing, re continuing relationship with your employee. Uh, for the past 15 years or more, a number of employers have tried to get around the employee stuff by calling a person an in independent contractor, not an employee. Um, there's a number of questions that can be asked to determine whether or not you are the employer or whether or not this person is, is an independent contractor. And one of the big ones is, does this person do the same service for other businesses? And does that person operate their service as a business? Um, that from time to time, um, there's inspectors out checking to see whether or not these people are employer employees or independent contractors. Uh, you can hire a payroll service to help you with the em employer paperwork and some of the services you can call them and tell them how many hours that person worked for you during the week and they'll mail a check. So it, it can be pretty easy. Uh, there's a couple more slides here. Looks like we've got a few more minutes. Uh, owners labor. This is a funny one. Generally, the owner of a business is not an employee. The owner does not get paid a wage or a salary except in a corporation when the person would be an employee. The owner takes a draw and that draw is not taxable. The profit is what's taxed. The owner gets a profit, which is their return to their investment and time. And the profit is used for living, family living needs, reinvesting in the business, or making principal payments. And then the owner pays a tax on the profit. So usually the owner does not get paid a salary, but gets they just take money from the business. And, um, It'd be easy for an owner to take too much cash from the business and the business would fold because there isn't enough money to operate with. But um, uh, that's, it's a funny little thing that an owner is not an employee. Self-employment tax is paid by the owner of the business based on the profit. Uh, it's, there's a special IRS form, Schedule SE, for self-employment. Uh, there's some income that's not subject to SE tax sale of business property like we talked about. Rent is not subject to self-employment tax. And investment income is not subject to self-employment tax. A funny little twist is that Social Security benefit is based on self-employment tax paid. For young families, you need 10 quarters of Social Security coverage in order to have um, disability benefits or survivor benefits in case the main operator is uh, injured or killed. Um, and then uh, for retirement benefits, you've got to have at least 40 quarters paid in. And if you have many, many years of low profit, it means you're going to have very, very low Social Security benefits. Uh, Vermont taxes, uh, the, for income tax, you begin with federal, federal data, federal income tax data. In Vermont, there's a homestead declaration uh, that says how much of your property tax is for your homestead and how much of it is for business. And you've got to watch the business use of the buildings on the property. Uh, there's a program called Use Value Appraisal of Farm and Forest Land. Uh, it's el you're eligible if you have gross sales of over $2,000 or at least 25 acres. And there's maps and applications due into Montpelier by September 1. Sales tax, you have to charge sales tax and you have to give that money to the state, but there's no sales tax on food. So, And then there's an ag sales tax exemption in Vermont that uses Vermont Form S3A. If you buy fertilizer, machinery, and equipment for your farm, you don't have to pay sales tax on it. 
But if that stuff can be used on non-farm businesses or for other purposes, um, you may have to pay sales tax on it. And this last year or two, uh, the Vermont Department of Taxes has been doing very, very strenuous audits on farm equipment dealers and has been getting hundreds of thousands of dollars of non-collected taxes from these businesses for, for items that they sold to what they thought were farms but uh, weren't. So you've got to be very careful with that. Uh, do it yourself or a professional. Uh, have you been doing your own taxes? If you've been doing your own taxes and have a pretty good idea of what it is and how it's like, you might be able to continue to do your own taxes just with the farm form. Um, how comfortable are you with it and how complex is your situation? Uh, some farms hire somebody to do their taxes for the first few years until they get the hang of it and then they start doing it themselves. Uh, TurboTax uh, can do the farm taxes, but it's not like talking with your own professional who understands what your purpose is in business and whether uh, depreciating something quickly is good for you and taking a lot of write-off now versus uh, slowing down the depreciation so in five years in the future you still have depreciation left on that when you're apt to be facing more profitable years. How do you choose a tax person? Um, you can ask your friends, you can look in the newspapers or yellow pages or online. You might see uh, somebody with, in your town with a tax sign outside their window. I know that I see several of those. You can interview them. Uh, there are some tax people that are registered preparers and enrolled agents and certified public accountants. And then Yankee Farm Credit is a farmer-owned co-op in our region that does a lot of farm taxes and they understand farm taxes very well. And um, there's more information, more detailed information available at these resources that I mentioned earlier, irs.gov, ruraltax.org, the Penn State Ag Alternatives publication EE0049 is a real good one and that Farm Doc Daily from the University of Illinois has information on health insurance. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you have a good year, good growing year, and I hope that you have plenty of profits and that uh, there will be profit enough for you to live on, reinvest, pay principal, save money, and pay your taxes. Thank you. So thank you, Dennis. I really appreciate you sharing that um, wealth of information. I know this can be a daunting uh, topic, but uh, Dennis is available if you have additional questions um, so that you can follow up on some of these things. Um, you'll see that I've posted a link to a SurveyMonkey survey for us. The link is not live, I don't believe, at this moment but um, it will be and we appreciate your input and uh, hope you'll join us next week. We have another uh, webinar that's focusing on developing wholesale markets um, on Wednesday at noon. So thanks very much and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks Heidi.